<clears throat> For the last several weeks, we've been doing a um, Foundations of Faith series live. We do a little webinar, and tonight we didn't do it for some reason. So, uh, but I can't stand it. Now I've got a pattern going, and uh, I want to keep it going. So I'm sitting in my backyard outside because it's finally not hot enough. You can come outside and breathe and and enjoy it. I had a uh, phone call today with a young man. He was talking about the next stage of his of his life. And that's always an interesting thing to try to to try to figure out. And I think it's the one thing that confuses more people than anything else. Where do I go next? What happens to me if I give up this aspect of myself that I've held on to for so long because it's my identity, it's who I am? What happens to me or what becomes to, of me if I no longer am angry about this or I'm not a victim? When we move through the stages of life, we leave certain things behind that are no longer relevant to our ability to successfully negotiate the next stage of our life. And there are very few parts of the Prosetta that more eloquently describe that process and the pain that precedes it and the actions necessary to move through it than when Frey becomes aware of Gerder. You see, in that tale, we find a fantastic story of a warrior of a young prince of a king of the son of a great god who becomes aware of something that might stir his heart more than the passions of battle or the anger of righteousness or the ability to be mad about something he becomes aware of something that stirs his heart onto something greater and it's as alien to him in his current state of mind as old age is to a young man and he has to sacrifice something to move into that next stage so i would like to talk tonight about what i am putting together here with regards to Frey and girder because i think it is one of those things that we all too often miss the same things that motivate us to do wonderful, great things when we're 20 are not the same things that should motivate us to do things when we are 35 or 40. And some of those things are going to have to be given up. So I will start with this introduction. Frey, the son of Bjorth, sat one day in Lyskjalf and looked over all the worlds. He looked into Jotunheim and saw there a fair maiden. That is key. Because everybody wants to point out the gods were giants. Yes, they were giants. They started from some simple basic stock. They were the raw material of what it means to become divine. And they have all sacrificed. They have all worked. They have all done something to become something more than what they were. This is something that we need to be looking at as well. That is an example that our gods have given us. And it's a powerful example that allows us to think, everybody I talk to and also true, there's a feeling right here in their heart that I'm worth something more, that there's something more to me, that I, I, I want to feel great, I want to feel important, I want to I be better. And yet we're never given clear instruction, or if we are, it's very vague, how do we grab that? How do we become that high performing individual that doesn't really care what everybody else thinks and they're going to grab a hold of success with everything they have? What does it take to do that? Well, all of the gods and goddesses started out as something much different and every one of them became something better because they were willing to grow. They were willing to shed old teachings they were willing to surround themselves with other like-minded, powerfully motivated individuals to form a group of individuals we know as the Aesir that we hold as holy. At any rate, Frey saw a maiden sitting in Jotunheim. Forthwith, he felt a mighty love sickness 
Skirner was name of Frey's servant. Newarth bade him ask speech of Frey. He said, go now, Skirner, and seek to gain speech from my son and an answer to win for whom the wise one is mighty moved. Now, there's a footnote there on that very first passage that sheds an interesting light on something. In um, both manuscripts uh, have then Scothi said, Scothi as Neward's wife, but Boogie, his emendation based on Snurry version is doubtless correct. It should say, our son, and Scothi asks that question. My son, both manuscripts and many editors have our son, which of course goes with the introduction of Scothi in the prose as the stanza is clearly addressed to Skirner, the change of pronouns. Instead of Njord, the old suggestion that's been lost in several translation is that Scothi is Frey's son. Frey, of course, Njord is his, the race of the veins and the Vanir in general. And Snorri thus describes North's family. North begat two children, Noatan. The son was named Frey and the daughter Freya. They were fair of aspect and mighty. Frey is the noblest of gods. He rules over rain and sunshine and therewith the fruitfulness of the earth. It is well to call upon him for plenty and welfare, for he rules over wealth for mankind. Freya, the noblest of the goddesses, when she rides to the fight, she has one half of the slain, and Odin has half. When she goes on a journey, she drives her two cats and sits in a cart. Love songs please her well, and it is good to call on her in love matters. And it's one of the few places you'll find where she is referred to as a goddess of love. So here we have this god of the sea, this Vanic deity, the sea, whose children literally represent the abundance that we all want to expect in our lives. These two great gods and goddesses, Frey. So in that little footnote alone from these first two stanzas is some real important stuff. Njord and Skadi, you know, sometimes they say they separate, sometimes they, they couldn't stand where each other lived. But if you look at it in just an elemental term from men trying to decipher how the world operates around them, you have the sea, you have the high mountain, and you have the rivers that flow back into the sea. You have that cycle of water. There we have Laguz kind of ties into that. The water evaporates from the ocean, forms clouds, and makes snow in the mountaintops, flows down the rivers back into the sea. There's a cycle. There's an elemental cycle there. And all of it, it re revolves around Laguz, that, that great substance that connects all life. And from that pairing, you find this child, Frey and Freya. And Frey is the god of sunshine and rules over the rain. But how interesting. And it's something that, in my mind, helps clarify a lot. Why wouldn't a child of the great snow-capped peaks and the deep blue oceans rule over sunshine and rain? The more powerful aspect, the more powerful version of that is Thor, where you have the father of the great sky gods and the mother earth that create this warder of men. <laughs> but I digress. Let's see, on that continuation with Skadi, it seems justified. The same confusion occurs in stanza two, where Skirnir in the manuscripts is made to speak of Frey, your son. Okay, The plural pronoun of the original involves a metrical error, which is corrected in the emanation by Boogie, so it should have been our son. Okay, Skirnir spake, Spay prithee, Frey, speak prithee, Frey, foremost of the gods, for now I fain I would know. Why sittest thou here in the wide halls, days long, my prince alone? Frey spake, how shall I tell thee, thou hero young, of all my grief so great? Though every day the elf beam dawns, it lights my longing never. So he's talking to this young warrior. And Frey is already this accomplished, powerful individual that is competent in war. He has a sword that fights of its own accord. How does the first sergeant relate to the private? because there's a knowledge gap there. There's a period of growth and development there that makes it very difficult for the private to understand what the first sergeant, how, what's he basing his decisions on? I don't get all this. And it's the same thing with the grandfather talking to a grandson. A grandfather cannot just pour all of his knowledge and wisdom into his grandson. He would never understand or comprehend. And the same thing is happening here with Skirner. Frey really points out, how should I tell thee, thou young hero? Well, that young hero 
is fixing to become the hero minus the young part. And Frey is fixing to become something else as well. Skirner spake, Thy longings, methinks, are not so large that thou mayest not tell them to me. Since in days of yore we were young together, we two might each other trust. you got to have a friend. you got to have somebody you can trust. And sometimes when the people you're dealing with or the people around you are in pain, you've got to remind them of that. You've got to remind them of the idea that I've been here with you all along, step by step. I got your back. When people get in pain, it's like a wounded bear crawls into a cave. We don't know how to share that. We don't know how to deal with that. We don't know how to grow from that. And it's very difficult to tell someone, there's something in me that hurts. I don't know how to tell you about it. Friends take care of each other. And when we get into Ossetru, sometimes we got to find those friends that understand what we're going through because in no uncertain terms, it is a time of powerful transition when we change the entire spiritual foundation of our life because all of a sudden we see a number of lies or changes or things that we were told that are not necessarily helping us move forward in this world. How do we deal with that? Well, we stick by each other's side. Frey spake, from Gimir's house I beheld go forth a maiden dear to me. Her arms glittered, and from their gleam shone all the sea and sky. This is a reference to the northern lights. So you have this goddess of the sunshine and rain and the northern lights, which is an interesting dynamic. It's hope in the middle of winter for this god of sunshine and, a, and an expectation of his return to those peaceful days. Um... Now, there was a stanza that was dropped out between seven and eight, and this has been tentatively reconstructed. It says, Hither to me shalt thou bring the maid, and home shalt thou lead her here, if her father wills it or wills it not, and good reward shalt thou get. So he's like, doesn't matter if daddy likes it, that woman's going to be mine. Stanza seven continues on, To me more dear than in days of old was ever made into man, but no one of gods or elves will grant that we both together should be. So... This warrior is confronted with a problem that he feels is seemingly insurmountable. He feels there's no solution to this, this, this tension, this love sickness, this thing that's kind of stymieing his ability to express who he is. It's not something he can go fight. It's not something he can go crush or destroy or win or be victorious about. He has no clue how to deal with this. And like most people who get in these situations, they begin to feel like the world is against them. When they, people get in the middle of depression or anxiety, the deck seems to be, it's seemingly stacked against them in all aspects of who they are. Skarnir spake, so his buddy comes to his, friend, his help. Then give me the horse that goes through the dark and the magic flickering flames, and the sword as well that fights of itself against the giant's grim. So his friend is there to help him. His friend is there to pick up the slack. His friend is there to give him a hand to help him Deal with what's going on. Fresh break the horse I will give thee that goes through the dark and the magic flickering flames, and the sword as well that will fight of itself if a worthy hero wields it. And it's a key term there. It's not going to, if a worthy hero wields it, that brings it back. It's not so much the sword that does the wonderful thing, but the hand that wields it. The uh, sword, though, Frey's gift of his sword to Skirner eventually proves fatal, for at the last battle when Frey is attacked by Belly, whom he kills barehanded, and later when the fire demon Sir, he slays him in turn, he is weaponless. And there's an interesting thing there that I, when I wrote Life and the Love of Life, I came across the uh, stories about the continental-wide wildfires, and I had this image of Frey standing there with this old farmer in a forest, and wildfires burning all around, and this farmer that's got an elk-handled farming implement or tool that is doing his best to protect everything he loves against the wildfires that's consuming everything around him. I think it's an interesting foundation for such a powerful legend. Skernier spake to the horse, Dark is it without, and I deem it time, to fare through the wild fells, to fare through the giant's fastness. We shall both come back, or us both together, the terrible giant will take. So he's reassuring the horse.
course, look, we're fixing to go through some tough stuff. And I'll stand by you the whole time. Once again, now we have an, an interpretation of Darun Awas, that teamwork, that union of, of man and beast, that horse, that great animal that helped us create civilizations, fight wars, found empires, and run simple farms. Awas is, a, is kind of important, this teamwork. And that is one of the things that the all three all-powerful Jotunus giantesses that entered Asgard during its golden age, one of them was Hrostiaf, the horse thief. She robbed them of the ability to work together. That love of gold and the bewitching of men's minds, gold bag and hythe and horse thief. The love of gold, bewitching of men's minds for treasure that's not theirs, and the horse thief so that they can't work together with anyone to get it. Skirnir reassures this horse that they're going to work together. And that's also a very powerful thing. Imagine it with, imagine you see someone that has a really good dog that's trained and they'll sit by. I mean, that's a beautiful thing there to work with these animals on the farm. Skirnir rode into Jotunheim to Gimir's house. There were fierce dogs bound before the gate of the fence, which was around Girth's hall. He rode to where a herdsman sat on a hill and said, Tell me, herdsman, sitting on the hill and watching all the ways, how may I win a word with the maid? Past the hounds of Gimir here, the herdsman spake, Art thou doomed to die, or already dead, thou horseman that ridest hither? Barred from speech shalt thou ever be with Gimir's good daughter good. So Gimir obviously understands, like most fathers should with their daughters, that they are a precious treasure to them. It's one of the most important relationships a young woman will ever have, is a healthy interaction and relationship with her father. This is where she will determine how she interacts with men for the rest of her life. This is the damage that fathers do to their daughters because they do not understand how to interact with women is incalculable. And we see the evidence of this all over the world. The fathers don't value what a daughter. Ymir here obviously understands the treasure that he possesses in a beautiful, healthy, vibrant daughter. Skirnir spake, boldness is better than plants can be for him whose feet must fare. To a destined day has mine age been doomed and my lifespan thereto been laid. So he just tells him, look man, it's going to be the way it's going to be and I'm still going to talk to her. So help me out here. What do we got to do? Girth spake. So, but raising all that cane draws her attention. Girth spake, what noise is out there which now so loud I hear within our house? The ground shakes and the home of Gimir around me trembles too. And it literally is kind of an earth-shaking experience when a young woman finally comes across that, that love that changes her life. When a father hands off a daughter in a marriage, there is... It's an it, that's exactly what's happening here. When the father gives a daughter's hand in marriage to a man, it is a, it's a world-changing event, the rumblings of which they hear first in their father's home. they got to figure out how to deal with that. They're not going to learn it watching the Kardashians. It is the responsibility of the mother and the crone to teach the maiden how this is supposed to happen. The serving maid spake, one stands without who has leapt from his steed and lets his horse loose to graze. Let's tell who she is. Girth spake, bid the man come in and drink good mead. Curiosity is aroused here within our hall, though I fear that there without my brother's slayer stands. So the brother's slayer, the, perhaps the brother is belly slain by fray. The only other references are in Volusia 53 and in Snorri's paraphrase of the Skirna is small, which merely says the Frey's gift of his sword to Skirna was the reason why he was weaponless when he met belly and killed him barehanded. Skirna himself never seems to have killed anybody. So that, he is just an image, a representation, an avatar of her brother's slayer. She asked, Art thou of the elves, or the offspring of the gods, or of the wise Vanir? How camest thou alone through the leaping flame, thus to behold our home? The accomplished warrior leaping through the flame on the horse is one more example of tradition and heritage. 
because this is the same set of circumstances that Sigurd traversed to meet Brunhild. He had to cross that ring of flame to cut free the Bernie so she might express the beauty of who she is. The same thing is happening here. This same dynamic is at effect. This young lady is going to leave the safety and security of her father's home. For Brunhild, it was kind of a restrictive affair, to say the least. That a young, accomplished warrior had it, was confident enough of a man to cross through the flame and free her from this restrictive environment where she might fully become a woman. Skrenir spake, I am not of the elves, nor the offspring of the gods, nor of the wise of Anir, though I came alone through the leaping flame, thus to behold my home, thy home. Eleven apples, all of gold, here will I give thee, Girth, to buy thy troth, that Frey may deem to be, to be dearest to you. Here's the first offering. Here's the first gift. He offers her 11 apples, all of gold. These are the apples of immortality. These are the apples that will allow you to live forever. The apples of Idun. Gareth spake, I will not take at any man's wish these 11 apples ever, nor shall Frey and I one dwelling find so long as we two live. Well, that's kind of bullheaded, don't you think? But given the circumstances, why wouldn't that be her answer? She has everything she needs in her father's home. She is safe. She is secure. She has a serving woman. There's obviously wealth and comfort in that home. Why would she give that up? She has the love of a man who understands her actions before she probably even makes them. And that's the thing with daughters and fathers. The father has known that daughter since she was a little girl. There would be no change. He's going to understand the actions and thoughts she's going to make before she even does them. Skirner spake, Then do I bring thee the ring that was burned of old with Odin's son. From it do eight of lightweight fall on every ninth night. And that's a powerful gift indeed. That represents treasure. That represents the ability to build an army. That represents a chieftain's ability to hand out a ring of loyalty to warriors every every ninth night. Eight warriors. You can build a pretty big army with that. Why would you want to adopt that stress? Girth spake the ring I wish not, though burned it was of old with Odin's son. In Gimmer's home is no lack of gold in the wealth my father wields. And there it is. She's got everything she needs there. She can't see any kind of legitimate reason she needs to leave that home. Skirnir spake, Seest thou, maiden, this keen, bright sword that I hold here in my hand? Thy head from thy neck shall I straightaway hew if thou wilt not do my will. Now he's just being mean. If you don't come with me, I'm going to cut your head off. Gareth spake, And that, when you threaten a woman with violence, they will dig in their heels like an Alabama tick. You know, if, a machine, if, if worms had machine guns, It'd be a different story for the bird. And this is kind of what he's come up against. For no man's sake will I ever suffer to be thus moved by might. But gladly, methinks, will Gimmer seek to fight if he finds it here. So she's got protection as well. She has wealth, protection, and comfort in her father's home. Why should she ever leave? Because she's not thinking about her future. In much the same way that Frey has to make a transition from that noblest of warriors. This maiden also has to make a transition to a wife and a full-grown woman. And there's an interesting, so she's got to go through this as well. So this is every bit as much a story about the coming of age of a woman as it is the coming of age of a man into a man past the savagery of being just a warrior. Skrenir spake, Seest thou, maiden, this keen bright sword that I hold here in my hand? Before its blade, the old giant bends, thy father is doomed to die. So there's a threat to her security. I strike thee, maid, with my magic staff, to tame thee to work my will. Thou shalt, There shalt thou go, where never again the sons of men shall see thee. On the eagle's hill shalt thou ever sit, and gaze at the, on the gates of hell. More loathes them to thee than the light huge snake, to men shall thou meet become. When you know it, there's a helicopter and decides to pass by. 
fearful to see if thou comest forth. Hunir will stand and stare. Men will marvel at thee. More fame shalt thou grow than the watchmen of the gods. Peer forth then from thy prison. Rage and longing, fetters and wrath, tears and torment are thine. When thou sittest down, my doom is on thee of heavy heart and double dole. And the giant's home shall vile things harm thee each day with evil deeds. Grief shalt thou get instead of gladness and sorrow to suffer with tears. This sounds like an ugly curse. But you have to wonder if the woman who is 75 or 80 years old, who's a widow, who has lost that beauty, who has finds herself alone, who finds herself without that protector in her home, perhaps this is simply getting old. Perhaps this is the fear of youth, of what old age might hold for them. They don't understand what comes with wisdom and comfort and security and love it's a terrifying idea and especially so for a young woman who is secure who is wealthy who is comfortable young and beautiful well, this is the most terrifying future she can imagine how could she possibly make a transition to that state of being which she knows is coming as we all do but to think about it being thrust upon you at an early age is terrifying indeed. With three-headed giants thou shalt dwell ever, or never know a husband. Let longing grip thee, let wasting waste thee. Be like to the thistle that in the loft was cast and there was crushed. I go to the wood and to the wet forest to win a magic wand. It misses a line there, and it says, I want a magic wand. Odin grows angry. Angered is the best of the gods. Frey shall be thy foe, most evil maid. Who magic wrath of gods has got for thyself? Give heed, frost rulers, and hear it, giants, sons of Sutung and God, ye too. How I forbid and how I ban the meaning of men with the maid, the joy of men with the maid. Rangamir is he, the giant who shall have thee in the depth by the doors of hell. To the frost giant's hall each day shalt thou fare, crawling and craving in vain, crawling and having no hope. Base wretches there by the root of the tree will hold for thee horns of filth. A fairer drink shalt thou never find, made to meet thy wish, made to meet thy wish. I write thee a charm and three runes therewith, longing and madness and lust. But what have I writ I may yet unwrite, if I find a need thereof. This is a not so gentle reminder of what the future holds for the fishwife the woman that is controlling, who takes control of the environment around her, who's in charge of everything, who has longing and madness and lust, and no healthy outlet for it. That's a powerful curse. And yet I see many women that, that put themselves in that spot because they have no clue, they have no guidance, they have no healthy outlet for what they're supposed to become. Much less do I see many men who are capable of creating that healthy environment where they might express who they are. I've worked in places before and you see a man and woman come in and you can tell when the woman is controlled by the hunted looks of the expression on the, uh, on the people that they're with. To see the interactions of these people in mass, people watch, you see individuals who are suffering in this way. You see individuals who just, well, this is what it is, I'm just going to have to deal with it. And that's a hard, bitter pill to swallow. And it seems like there might not be any escape for some of them, but some of these people find their way to also true. And then we find something like that. We find some wonderful idea that says, you know what, there is something better. There is something that will allow me to become something more. But what it means is that I'm going to have to sacrifice some of these ideas that I think are protecting this very special part of who I am. And this is especially especially true of women. What happens to them if they set free those boundaries? Is it safe to do so? Are they with a partner that is strong enough to allow them to finally unclench or relax or be comfortable, to be safe? We live in a very crazy world. We live in a dangerous world in a lot of places. 
how are we going to create that? How are we as men going to create that? Well, one, we have to go through a stage of our life where we have to be warriors, where we have to be men who engage in the battle to be able to create that environment and protect just the front door of your home. There's a lot to that. And I guarantee you when I write the book, I'll write this chapter of the book, it's going to be in depth. But there's hope there. Gareth spake, find welcome rather, and with it take the frost filled cup with me. Though I did not believe that I should so love every one of the wains. So there's an opportunity here for growth. To leave the safety of the father's home and find another man that might be just as powerful as she is. It might create that environment where she would be safe. Skinner spake, my tidings all must I truly learn, ere homeward hence I ride. How soon thou wilt with the mighty son of New York a meeting make. Okay, you've given your word. How long is it going to take to do it? Earth spake, Barry there is, which we both know well, a forest fair and still, and nine nights hence to the son of New York will girth at their grant delight. Then Skinner rode home, Frey stood without, and spoke to him and asked for tidings. Tell me, Skirner, ere thou take off the saddle, or fairest forward a step, what hast thou done in the giant's dwelling to make glad thee or me? Skirner spoke, Barry there is, which we both know well, a forest fair and still, and nine nights hence, to the son of New York, will girth their grant delight. Gray spake, long as one night, and longer are two, how then shall I bear three? Often to me has a month seemed less than now half a night of desire. So in that bargain, Frey has sacrificed that sword. Skirner is now in possession of that sword. Frey has sacrificed that very powerful phallic symbol of masculinity as a warrior to become a husband. He has made this transition of growth. And it's, he's going to have to think about it for nine nights. A period of growth. A period of incubation. A period of change. We don't get where we are overnight. And we're not going to change who we are overnight. It's going to take some time. And just like that, if it just happened, the fairy tale ending and all that stuff, there's always a period of time where we got to change something. we got to grow. Odin hanging on the tree for nine nights was a period of incubation where he cut away those ideas that kept him from becoming who he was supposed to become. And the much more simpler aspect of every man, Frey, represents he makes that transition by setting aside the path of the warrior to engage on the path of the husband. And it takes some time to decompress from that. Similarly, Gerth has to, Gerter has to go through a similar transition. She's got to come to grips with a huge amount of uncertainty. Will this individual be able to provide that same kind of safe environment that my father has for so long? So in that nine nights that they have to wait They've both got to do some growing, some changing, before they can adopt and, and engage in the healthy relationship that is required of these new roles they're adopting. So when we look at that whole tale, when we look at all of it, we find some very powerful indicators of what it takes to change, to become something more, to become a good husband, to become a good wife. We set aside some of those things that brought us to that crossroads to begin with. For us to become a good husband, we can't be the belligerent, drunken, buffoon, full of righteous indignation, or with the old warrior's idea about beating everybody up. And for the girl, we can't simply be sitting there making sure that they, this dude understands that, well, my father knew how to do this. How come you don't? Why aren't you doing this? How come I blah, blah? <laughs> you got to grow out of that. And that's what they're doing here. So with that, it's one of the, um, that's one of the, my favorite stories in the whole thing is it speaks of growth and healthy relationships and what we would all want to be a part of. So I'll get this downloaded and uploaded to YouTube and put it all back up. And I hope you enjoyed it. And I thank, I thank you for joining me here tonight in the dark with these bugs, this is terrifying. <laughs>